everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Denise Minger. Denise is a health writer and lecturer known for aggressively challenging today's leading voices of conventional wisdom. Her thorough critiques of the USDA guidelines and the China study have made her a major player in the progressive health community and a major thorn in the side of both mainstream nutritionists and other health figures promoting flawed dietary dogma. Today, we are going to discuss her first book, Death by Food Pyramid, How Shoddy Science, Sketchy Politics, and Shady Special Interests Ruined Your Health. She wrote this here in Portland, Oregon, I'm delighted and proud to say, while living a real food lifestyle. Welcome, Denise. Hi, so nice to be on your show. I must say, I admire your courage in trying to make sense of the tangled snake pit of dietary advice and to do so with no axe to grind. Very impressive. What set you on this path of investigation? Um, It's actually kind of a long story, and it started way back when I was seven years old. That was when I first entered um, basically the world of health and nutrition because I decided at that age to go vegetarian And at the time, it wasn't actually a nutritional concern. I had almost choked on a piece of steak, (laughs) and I became very phobic of anything with a meat texture. So I stopped eating meat at that point and had to be um, more aware of the foods that I was eating. And then a few years later, when I was 11, I was diagnosed with a weed allergy after being very, very ill for an entire year with some mystery thing that none of the, the conventional doctors I saw could figure out. So I had to stop eating wheat. A few years later, I also became sensitive to dairy and soy, so I had to weed those out of my diet. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't eat meat, wheat, dairy, soy, or pretty much any food that my friends were eating. And so um, at that time, I was also just very sick all the time. I caught colds almost on a like weekly basis. I was getting ear infections, bronchitis, um, on antibiotics quite a bit. And so I started researching just online um, different eating programs and diff- different ways to use diet to uh, you know combat a poor immune system. And one of the diets I came across was raw veganism. It was especially this, uh, this niche diet that was focused on eating almost nothing but raw fruits and vegetables. And at the time I had no background in nutrition training. I had no understanding of human physical processes or biochemistry or anything like that. And so I was, um, I fell very easily into the trap of listening to people on the internet (laughs) who seem like they're very confident in what they believe and know. And so I spent a full year following a very, very rigid, strict, limited diet of basically nothing but fruits and vegetables. And although I felt wonderful at first, after about a year of eating that way, um, I ended up with 16 cavities in my mouth after a lifetime of nearly perfect dental health. And my hair was falling out. I weighed about 95 pounds. I just could not keep weight on. And um, I also went to the doctor and was diagnosed with quite a few deficiencies after a blood test. So at that point, I realized, which is something I think many people face when they're entering the nutrition world, um, it's really hard to know who to trust and what to trust and what to believe out there. And so I developed developed a very strong skepticism at that point of the things I had been hearing because I realized I fell so easily under the spell of people who I'd never seen even in person, but who had, you know, credentials or letters after the name or who said they were experts in certain areas of nutrition. And I realized I really cannot trust these people with my health because look what happened to me. So my whole introduction into the health world, um, especially as a researcher, was to fix my own body. And I think that's something a lot of people experience. You don't really get that curious about nutrition or passionate about it until you have to use it in your own life to fix a problem that you're having. So that was my whole introduction into that that uh, that field, and um, it really kindled my interest in nutrition and just the way food can impact the human body. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I might add that uh, Denise um, modestly didn't mention it, but she's a bit of a wunderkind, and she entered college at the age of 16, so she brings a formidable intelligence to her investigations. What did you study in college as a matter of interest? Um, that was also a long story. I ended up studying English as my final major, but I switched from studio art to several of the hard science, sciences um, and soft sciences as well. I studied psychology, sociology, archaeology, geology. Um, I wanted to be a park ranger for a little bit, so I studied parks and recreation management. 
um, then went back to art a few times and just kind of wobbled back and forth between the creative arts and the sciences because I love both of those things and I, I always felt like I wanted to integrate them. Um, so it was kind of difficult choosing a major and you know sticking with one path in college. Um, but I stuck with English just because the common denominator and everything I love to do is writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you really kind of blazed a trail when you undertook a critique of something called the China Study. Tell us what it was and um, what did that do for your subsequent path? Sure. Yeah. So the China Study... Um, back when I was a vegan or freshly coming out of my vegan phase, there was a book that came out called The China Study, and it was written by um, a professor emeritus at Cornell named T. Colin Campbell, who just has this fabulous research career. He has done so many things and sat on so many committees and really seen a lot that goes on behind the scenes in the nutrition world. And also because of his cred- credentials, he tends to have a lot of um, you know, authority, and you, you see, see this as a person who can be trusted and who has a lot of experience and knows what he's talking about. So this book came out called The China Study, and the namesake, the book's namesake was a, an actual study called The China Study, which was conducted in rural China in the 1970s and 1980s. And it was a massive epidemiological project, which studies basically disease trends at the population level. And what the study did was um, the Chinese government, Cornell University, and I believe Oxford College as well, um, teamed up and uh, sent surveyors out into these uh, 65 rural counties in China. And these counties were selected specifically because the people living there um, were eating the same diet from birth until death. It wasn't like in America where people are hopping from Atkins diet one day to South Beach to veganism the next day. These were people who had to live off of the foods in their local communities. And as a result, it would be much easier, hypothetically, to see um, what kinds of foods would be leading or related to certain disease outcomes. And it just seemed like a very ripe opportunity to um, study people uh, who are eating the same kind of diet consistently in uh, you know, their communities. So a bunch of surveyors were sent out to measure all sorts of variables within these communities, things like people's blood markers, um, you know, their blood sugar levels, various uh, LDL levels, um, cholesterol, um, insulin, um, you know, like vitamin levels in their blood, and just the, everything imaginable related to their health. Um, as well as uh, from the 1970s, there was a bunch of data taken um, regarding disease mortality and how people were dying. So there was a bunch of data on the disease rates in this area as well. And uh, then the surveyors basically did a 24-hour follow of people in each community. And they would record meticulously what the people were eating throughout that 24-hour time span, weighing food, measuring it to make sure they had accurate measurements. And they also gave a survey to um, the inhabitants of these different counties, asking them, um, you know, to just describe their yearly eating habits. And so all this data, there's over, I think it was something like 365 variables were documented, which is quite a bit for a study of this size. And um, in the end, the researchers ended up uh, just pouring over their data and finding correlations. There, you know, there are tens of thousands of correlations they dug up from all of the things they measured. Things like, okay, people who are eating more, you know, green vegetables are dying less of heart disease. And uh, they just published all of the, their findings, just the raw, uninterpreted data, in a giant book called um, Diet, Lifestyle, and Mortality in Rural China. And so this book and all, all the findings in it were supposedly the basis of the China study book that T. Colin Campbell wrote. And um, I should mention there's only one chapter in his book that's actually dedicated to the China study, and there's a lot of other things he wrote about. But I was really interested in this study in particular just because it received so much publicity and it was held in such high regard as a very well-designed, well-conducted study. So um, when I was becoming a non-vegan, I, I actually reversed a lot of my health problems by reintroducing animal foods. And so I had to abandon the vegan ideology after a while. Um, but when I was entering that phase of my life where I was realizing, okay, animal products might actually be healthy, at least for my body, um, I would go back onto vegan message boards and places I used to work online and uh, and get into kind of heated debates. <laughs> I won't we'll call them <laughs> arguments, I'll call them debates, with people on those vegan forums who are suffering from health problems that looked similar to the ones I faced. And so my initial um, goal was just to help these people and share my story with them to see if it could help. And instead of that working out the way I had hoped, 
I ended up just getting banned left and right from these message boards. And quite often, whatever I would say about animal products would be greeted with the response of, just read the China study because you are wrong because this book proves you wrong, blah, 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 blah. And so that would kind of end the argument. So after the 80th time or so of hearing this China study book thrown at me, I decided I'm actually going to go and research the researcher. I'm going to see where he got his findings because this whole book was based um, on the, the premise that animal protein, um, not even just saturated fat, but like animal protein itself and only from animal sources, is a promoter of cancer as well as heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and all these things that go wrong with the human body. And so the book's whole thesis is that animal foods are very harmful because animal protein has um, these unique qualities that make it extremely harmful for the human body. And supposedly, according to this book, that study, the China study, uh, proved this. And so I went back to that raw data. I spent about two to three months just geeking out over all of these numbers. I love math. I love statistics. And what I found was that the author's um, interpretation of that data really did not match up to what I was finding, what I was reading. And so at the time, I had this little blog going that I started up mostly because I kept getting banned from places all over the Internet, and I wanted a place where nobody could ban me. So I decided I'll start my own blog, and no one can get rid of me on my blog. And so at the time, I just wanted to have this little platform. I didn't expect to have many readers, and I didn't for a long time. And I, I posted a very long critique of everything I found wrong and misleading about the China study book. And so I posted that online. I sent it to a few people I thought might be interested in it. And then basically overnight, it went viral on the Internet. And my blog went from having maybe 80 views a day um, to about 20,000 overnight, which just baffled me when I woke up. I, I checked my WordPress stats, and I thought that there must be a glitch because I saw the little bar that measures your viewer count, and it was like just skyrocketing. I was like, what's going on? So um, I have, uh, I'm actually greatly indebted to a few people who have other blogs who helped promote my critique and just um, you know bullhorn it all over the Internet. And so that's what got my blog kind of under or in the you know the, the radar of nutrition people all across the internet and um, at that point I realized how fun it was to dissect bad science and I kind of started branching out at that point beyond just vegan issues and into um, uh, other issues related to health. You talk about um, uh, so many things <clears throat> it's really kind of hard to know where to start but <laughs> Because your book is titled a Death by Food Pyramid, let's talk about the USDA Food Pyramid, which represents the government-approved guidelines for public nutrition. And you suggest that it's been strongly influenced by the combined forces of big business, shady politics, and I love this quote, slippery science. <laughs> Give us some examples of these influences and, and the conclusions that you've drawn from it. Sure. So one of the most interesting things when I started working on this book was I had to just do, a, you know, an investigation of how our food pyramid came into existence. And I think most of us out there, especially those of us who grew up in the 90s or beyond, um, are familiar with that image of the food pyramid. You know, it's just a triangle with this big um, grain base that's 6 to 11 servings of grains, you know, the breads, the pastas, the bagels. And then at the top is the used sparingly tip, which has, has the sugars and the fats, and it, it gives the impression that fat is very bad and that our diets can be a starch free-for-all. So um, I went investigating just, you know, how this pyramid came about, who was involved, um, how those recommendations came into play, because I think today a lot of us have realized that eating that much of our diet as grains and especially processed starches is not always beneficial. And a lot of people have improved their health by changing those recommendations. So one of the things I found was that the pyramid, even though it was released in 1992, its roots can actually be traced back to the 1970s. And what happened at that time was um, the original, there was a food guide in place called the Basic Four, which was, um, I believe it was created around World War II, and it was just kind of uh, very vague, you know, eat a lot of everything so that you can stay well nourished. Very few actual specifications about serving size or anything like that. And um, by the 1970s, uh, the USDA was getting pressured to improve those recommendations and find something that would help improve American health. And so the woman who had created that Basic Four, the nutritionist, um, she called this woman named Louise Light, who had, at the time had been working at New York University teaching. And she said, hey, Louise Light, we would like to recruit you to make our next food guide. We'd like you to come down to the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center and do a whole bunch of 
research and expert conventions and just figure out what it is Americans should be eating. And so Louise Light ended up taking that position. She um, uprooted her whole family and took them down to Maryland to work at the center. And uh, for a year, she spent her time poring over the literature at the time that was available, showing links between diet and disease in humans, um, convening groups of expert nutritionists and agricultural workers, just trying to figure out how can we feed Americans in a way that will still be economically feasible, but that will improve our health. And so once this year was over, um, she had assembled a very, what she felt was very science-based in terms of um, recommending foods for Americans to eat. And her whole guide at that time was based on fresh produce, fresh fruits and vegetables. She thought that cold-pressed cold fats like olive oil, flaxseed oil, marine oils should be used liberally in the diet. There was no hint of this fat phobia in her recommendations. And she believed as well that grains should be limited to two to three servings a day per person, always in whole form. She thought that any kind of refined grain would just be junk carbohydrates and that people should be strictly avoiding or strictly limiting those foods. And um, so she, she basically recommended that only you know, very active men or very large people who needed a lot of energy would be, conser be uh, consuming up to three grains uh, a day or servings of grains a day. And then for the rest of the population, one or two servings. And um, so she felt very confident about this guide that she had designed because she spent so long researching it. And she admitted it to the Secretary of Agriculture at the time to get it approved. And here's where it gets interesting. Instead of getting approved, that guide came back to Louise Light completely mangled. And what had happened was those grains that she felt should be limited had exploded to form the base of the new food guide. The USD had changed the two to three or one to three recommendation servings um, to six to 11 servings. And at the same time, her recommendations for this you know, fruit and vegetable based diet that fruits and vegetables had been slashed down to about two to three servings a day total for both of those um, uh, for the American public instead of her recommendation had been something like seven to nine servings. And um, she, she looked at the, you know, this mangled version of the things she had created and she was completely flabbergasted. And so she asked what happened? Why did this get changed? Why were all these, my recommendations that were science-based get completely warped? And the only response she got was, you know, some vague answer about needing to keep the cap on the food stamp program, which was odd to her because no one had ever mentioned this to her. And she felt that that answer was just um, somebody was basically uh, trying to keep her in the dark about what had really gone on beyond the USDA's closed doors. And um, so it wouldn't be for another maybe 15, 16, 17 years that the USDA's pyramid actually came out. But that was the seed. That was the um, the core of the recommendations that ended up blooming into the, the food guide pyramid that we saw so many years later. And according to Louise Light, she felt like um, the USDA had been working. There had been some financial pressures and economic pressures to make the American diet grain-based. And as I did a little bit more research, I found that in the 1970s, right along the same time when Louise Light was working on this food guide, um, American farmers were, especially grain farmers, were under, um, or they were starting to pressure the USDA to make changes to help their, their crops become more profitable because they were losing a lot of money. There were farmers who were protesting outside of the agricultural office, left and right, even late into the night to the point where the secretary of agriculture sometimes had to crawl out of his bathroom window to get home because <laughs> he couldn't leave. Yeah, he couldn't leave his front door because there were farmers standing out there completely angry, ready to just punch him. And uh, so there was a lot of political pressure, a lot of economic pressure, um, a lot of things that had nothing to do with human health that went into forming these recommendations. And we can still see today that our most profitable crops out there are wheat, corn, and soy, which, again, are just kind of in every single food that you see in a you know, crinkly tinfoil package. <laughs> it's kind of this, that, the same big three. Um, but there's mm -hmm. definitely a huge incentive to get Americans to eat a lot of those very profitable foods. And if you think about it, the USDA, it's the United States Department of Agriculture. Their entire mission is almost um, contradictory from the start because they're appointed to both promote agricultural interests while also supporting human health. And so often those agricultural interests are at complete odds with what would uh, be necessary to make humans healthier. So the USDA kind of has this divided conflict of interest within itself um, that really manifests whenever it issues food guidelines. That's a very good point. Um, let's take the example of Crisco. I 
was just reviewing it last night, and the the whole um, emergence of hydrogenation as a uh, an acceptable food stuff is fascinating. Right. Yeah, so that, that whole thing, Crisco, you know, it's uh, such an iconic food, especially for earlier in the last century. Um, but what most people don't know is actually first produced by Procter & Gamble um, soap makers. The, co the company originally started as a soap and candle making company. And at the time, um, there were all these excess cotton seeds around from um, just cotton seed gin or mills. And uh, there was no use for them at the time. They were just kind of sitting around rotting. And at the time in France, a uh, chemist had just established this hydrogenation of oil, which was a way to make liquid oils into something solid. And it was a beautiful ingredient for soaps and uh, especially just to replace things like lard, which had become more expensive, which were traditionally used for soap and candle making. And um, Procter & Gamble had the brilliant idea of feeding this to humans because this hydrogenation process with cottonseed oil could make this creamy product that was a beautiful um, ingredient replacement for things like lard and butter, which at the time were becoming more and more expensive. And so um, it was a really brilliant example of marketing and just uh, convincing consumers that they needed something that they had not even known existed a few minutes earlier. And so the whole birth of Crisco um, was basically a way to feed garbage to humans. <laughs> and it's a little bit sad thinking of it that way, but the hydrogenation process, at the time, nobody really knew how harmful it was. They didn't really know much about trans fats and its effect on the human body. So um, we saw this huge rise of Crisco being promoted as this almost miracle wonder food. And um, it just started infiltrating American pantries and replacing lard as this new, pure, beautiful white fat that you could use in cooking to make delicious pastries and pie crusts and whatever. Right. And uh, I'm sure many people who live back in that area, era still today will remember, you know, just having Crisco in your pantries. And um, Well, I certainly do. Yeah. So, of course, that has bloomed into the whole um, vegetable oil industry. But we'll get back to the elements. Let's move on to Weston Price. What was his contribution so Weston Price, he is one of my personal heroes, honestly. Um, and I should mention too, actually, it was finding his, about him, finding out about him and his um, his work in the early 1900s that uh, helped me fix my own health after I had been destroying it as a raw vegan. And who he was, he was a dentist from Cleveland, Ohio, who started noticing around the turn of the century, 1900s, um, that more and more patients were coming into his office with crowded dental arches with teeth that were in rapid decay, um, especially young people. And before the, you know, this, this time period, he had, uh, for the most part, people had healthier teeth that he had noticed. And for whatever reason, there were suddenly all these deformities occurring within the jaw structure. And um, he was intrigued and fascinated about why this was happening and kind of determined to figure out what the answer was. So he embarked on a global quest to find groups of humans who are still eating their these traditional diets that had not been touched by white flour or by vegetable oils or by canned foods or refined sugar, people who had been eating these diets that their um, parents, their grandparents, their great-great-great-grandparents, on and on and on had been eating for generation after generation. And the logic behind this was that these groups of humans, um, they were able to sustain themselves in beautiful, robust health just eating these foods that their environment had provided, their environment had provided. and um, unlike the Western areas that had been just infiltrated with these modern foods, um, the the primitive populations who are still eating their traditional diets, they did not get this rampant dental decay that Western Price had been observing among people in his own practice. And so he went from literally like every corner of the globe from the Arctic to Africa to um, just rainforests and all over the place looking for groups of humans who are still isolated. And this was, I believe, in the 1930s or so. So um, today this would be a much harder experiment to embark on. But at the time, it was a good opportunity, perhaps the last time in history such a thing would be possible. So he went from group to group, to group, to group recording um, photographs of people's beautiful teeth that were growing in perfectly straight, cavity-free without brushing, 
these people who had never been um, to an orthodontist to get their braces on, you know, their, their teeth were just growing perfectly naturally. And uh, he took note, extensive notes about what their diets were. And he talked to um, people of each community to um, understand what kinds of foods they valued and thought were important. And what he found was that regardless of how different the diets were, you know, some people were eating a ton of meat like the Eskimos. Others were living largely on more plant-based diets, but supplementing with seafood. Um, there were a lot of marine coastal areas that um, were supporting a lot of uh, great, healthy human populations. What he found across the board were that all of these populations that were in robust health were eating some source of um, fat-soluble vitamins from their food. And this was from foods like fish eggs, um, you know, uh, regular egg yolks, um, hard cheeses that had been fermented to have a high content of vitamin K2, um, butter from cows that were eating rapidly growing grass, which tends to increase the vitamin content of the dairy that they produce. Um, there was a lot of uh, like seaweed consumption. Marine foods were biggie. Insects, some places ate insects that were also very high in fat-soluble vitamins. Um, organ meats were very popular. And uh, so in each area, even though they had very dissimilar diets on the surface, they all had this common denominator of eating a lot of fat-soluble vitamins. And those are those tend to be vitamin D, vitamin K2, vitamin K, vitamin A, um, vitamin E as well. And uh, so Price returned back to the States after acquiring all of this information going on this huge journey. And what he did was this, in his own practice, he started trying to replicate the core findings that he had um, accrued from all these different dietary um, patterns that he'd observed in these populations, and he had put his patients on diets rich in these fat-soluble vitamins, as well as some other factors that he had uh, kind of pieced together on his travels. And what he found was that he could actually reverse tooth decay and have people's cavities grow in without any drilling if he put them on a nutrient-rich diet. And uh, so this is kind of mind-boggling because, you know, you go to the dentist today and if you ask, you know, is there anything I can do to fix my cavity naturally, they'll, they'll tell you, no, it's impossible. Um, but, you know, many years ago, this was actually being done in a clinical setting. And um, so because I had so many teeth issues, I was very drawn to the work of Weston A. Price. And actually, it was applying his own findings to my life that helped uh, helped my mouth heal. Um, I did need a lot of work on it after my mm -hmm. vegan stint, <laughs> but um, my mouth has been much better since uh, applying these findings. One of the interesting uh, results that he reported, and, and you kind of summarize it with a very charming little phrase, nose to tail. Right. Uh, he did point out that these societies, when they ate an animal, they ate the entire animal inside and out. Right, yeah. Yeah, so this is a practice, I think, that has really been lost in our modern culture. Um, you know, you walk into a grocery store and you see these big meat shelves lined with ground beef and chicken breast, turkey breast, chicken wings, and those are what we call skeletal muscle, um, and, uh, mu skeletal muscle meats, and they tend to dominate the American diet. But there's actually a whole lot of the animal <laughs> that's still edible that we tend to just discard. And all these healthy communities were eating um, those other animal parts, things like the organs, liver especially. Liver is incredibly nutrient-dense, and it's one of the healthiest foods you can eat. Um, you know, these tribes, they would, still, they would eat brains. They would eat the internal organs, the intestines, basically all parts of the animal. And then even when those foods were consumed, they would take the bones and turn those into bone broth by, um, you know, simmering them in water to leach out those minerals that are locked into the bone, as well as um, some of the glycine, which is in the connective tissue on animals. And uh, so those those uh, practices really have been lost these days. And I think it's a great idea to return to those that way of eating, just using the entire animal instead of discarding so much of it, both for nutrition and for uh, preventing just wastefulness. Yeah, I was surprised that in the Inuit communities, they actually fed the muscle meat to their dogs while they ate the internal organs. Yeah, so they, they felt that those internal organs were the most valuable parts mm -hmm. of the animal. Yeah. And uh, another community that you mention um, would wait until the moose would come down with enlarged thyroids. They would then eat the thyroid glands as a delicacy, and then there would be this nine months later spate of births. Right. So this was really fascinating because this was a, an inland tribe in the far north 
you know, they didn't have a lot of seafood in their diet, and uh, they tended to not have a lot of um, caloric plant matter in their diet. So their diet was very low in carbohydrates. And uh, what would happen is they'd basically be nearly infertile for most of the year until they had access to these thyroid glands. And what that tells us is that they probably had low thyroid function, which, which tends to affect fertility um, until they're able to basically supplement their diets with this external source of thyroid hormone. And so they'd eat the thyroid, fertility would um, temporarily boost, and then, of course, everyone would... Uh, Nine months later, be popping out the children. <laughs> the only <laughs> time of year that they were, their bodies were able to support a pregnancy and to actually get pregnant was after eating that thyroid. And so I think that actually has a lot of um, potential repercussions for people who are eating a long-term, low-carbohydrate diet today. Um, it's very important to make sure that your thyroid stays in good health. Absolutely. In fact, we're going to be interviewing uh, somebody in a few weeks about her book of iodine deficiency. Oh, wow, nice. Yeah. Now, um, there are so many diets out there. Everybody thinks that they have the, 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 the final ultimate answer, whether it's the paleo or the Mediterranean or the vegan or the vegetarian, etc. Um, you've been waiting and making some amazing sense out of all of this. And at the end of the day, what you said in your book was that it's easier to decide what not to eat than to decide, you know, what the best approach is because people are so different. So let's start with what are the no-no's? So if we look at all of these successful diets out there, no matter how different they seem on the surface, what we can tell from each one of them is that they tend to avoid a certain grouping of foods, and those include refined grain, especially refined um, wheat flour, which, of course, dominates the American diet. Um, they tend to avoid those highly processed vegetable oils like corn oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, um, those which also tend to be very high in omega-6 fats, which are um, in far too abundant in most of our diets. We don't need that much, and, and these oils are markedly absent from most uh, health-promoting diets. So we can say that's probably a no-no. And refined sugar as well. Um, you know, if uh, those traditional communities that Price studied, if they used a sweetener, it would be in the form of honey or maple syrup. But no one had access at the time to this, uh, you know, large source of uh, refined sugar or high fructose corn syrup. And so I think we can safely say that those foods are probably not great for us and they're definitely not necessary in our diets. So just by excluding those foods and moving towards a more whole foods diet where no matter how much meat versus plant food you're eating, the, the foods you are eating are in their whole food form still looking like they were in nature for the most part. Um, I think that's the direction that all of these uh, you know, health-promoting diets tend to point to. You had a fascinating graphic in your book of the comparison amongst different vegetable oils and their ratio of omega-6s uh, to omega-3s that one would get, say, in salmon. Mm -hmm. And you, you've kind of uh, made the comparison between one ounce of salmon versus one ounce of vegetable oil. Tell us what your findings were there. Yeah, so if we look at that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, um, the American diet tends to be extremely high in omega-6 and extremely deficient in omega-3s. And um, a big reason for that, again, goes back to those vegetable oils, which um, seeds in general tend to be much higher in omega-6 than in omega-3s. And so when we condense those seeds into their oil form and use those as our, our dominant oils for cooking, what happens is our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio gets way skewed out of whack. And if we look at something like salmon, it's um, you know, very high in omega-3 fats. It's, it has much more omega-3 than it does omega-6. But if we contrast that to something like soybean oil, we see that huge dominance of omega-6 versus omega-3. And uh, so my whole recommendation with that is, you know, if you're going to be eating a lot of poly polyunsaturated fat, which are, you know, include those omega, omega oils, um, it should definitely be in the form of, like, marine foods rather than these industrial processed seed oils because those ones, again, tend to be so high in the type of omega fats that we do not need more of. Mm -hmm. And... What were your findings relating to metabolic syndrome? 
Did you? I don't remember how how much you went into that. Um, I don't believe I went very far into that. Although um, one interesting thing is that people with metabolic syndrome, if you look at the studies out there, this is uh, one of those things that determines who's going to do well on a certain type of diet versus who's going to do poorly on it. Um, people with metabolic syndrome versus people who do not have metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome people tend to do better on um, carbohydrate restricted diets and ones that are you know reduced in sugar and refined carbohydrates. And uh, so that's this is part of the reason we get so confused about the studies we hear because a lot of times people whose bodies and metabolism is also already broken in some sense they're going to respond rather poorly to certain foods that might not actually be bad for the rest of the population mm -hmm. uh, this was i think a, a a really majorly important point that you made that um we see people who ascribe to a particular diet or lifestyle as identifying with that diet and forgetting about their own personal individuality. Um, having been in the vegan world and seen the uh, enormous emotional response you got on the web to any hint of stepping out of line, um, what would you say to to expand on that point. Um, yeah, so what I really recommend any health seeker out there keep in mind is that, first of all, there's probably not a single optimal diet that's going to work equally well for all humans on the planet. In fact, I will I will bet money <laughs> say, to say that that's not the case. And we have a lot of information now about different genetic differences that um, people inherit, you know, from their parents. Um, how your health history can affect what foods are best for you, how your um, even the microbes in your gut can influence what kind of foods you're going to respond well to. So when I was a vegan and going through that whole experience, um, what I noticed was that there were certainly some people who do very, very well on plant-based diets, and there are other people who seem to crash and burn very easily on that kind of diet. And to say that just because one person is having success on that diet um, – that's not a reason to believe that the other person must be doing something wrong if they're experiencing problems. I think what we all need to do is respect where we see success and where we see failure and not, not a maintain this blame the victim mentality where if you fail on a diet, it's your fault. It's not the diet's fault because the diet's perfect. I think that's a very poor way of looking at it. Um, I, I really just want to encourage people to remember that individuality in terms of diet is very real and it's very big. And uh, I, I really hope that our warring diet communities, you know, paleo versus Mediterranean diet versus low carb versus vegan versus raw vegan, whatever, um, instead of just attacking each other left and right, I think we could all wisen up quite a bit if we just open our eyes and try to see why people are having success in these different arenas, even if their success is different than our own. Here, here. <laughs> uh, that that really is such an important point in in getting in touch with your own body, really ma making friends with your own body and listening to what it tells you. And I might also point out, as you point out in your book, that once you give your body a rest uh, from foods that irritate it, that inflame it, then you can later go back and you'll find that you will not be so reactive to these same foods. But, of course, everything in moderation. So let's give us a recap, Denise. What, um, what do you think are the most important points to keep in mind in constructing your own diet? The first one is that what works today might not necessarily be what works tomorrow. <laughs> kind of going back to what you just said. Um, what I find I see a lot of people running into is that they'll find a diet that seems to work beautifully for them for maybe a few months or a year, and then it stops working as well, or they develop a new set of health problems different than the ones they were originally trying to treat. And the, the danger there is to cling to the diet that you believe was working for you and try to recapture you know, those, those initial moments of success um, without realizing that your body may actually be having different needs now. So first rule is just keep an open mind, keep paying attention to your body and checking in with what's going on rather than finding a diet and rigidly adhering to it and clinging to it and being resistant to change. So just, uh, you know, always be open to, to changes and to new information. Um, 
along with that, I would recommend that uh, people don't just latch on to certain health experts um, who are feeding them, you know, the same regurgitated answer over and over. What I have found very um, helpful in my own life is to listen to people who I disagree with, as well as people who are kind of on the same page as me, and uh, you know, just keep that open dialogue and keep uh, challenging your own beliefs because, you know, it's very easy for any of us to be wrong. Nutrition is still in many ways in its dark ages. We're still learning a lot. Um, so just uh, always, or I guess that the, goal, the summary of that point would just be avoid falling under the spell of groupthink. And don't just surround yourself with people who are believing the same thing as you, but actually branch out and listen to the other side as well. Just keep, keep that dialogue open and flowing. And then along with that, um, I just say use common sense when it comes to diet, and uh, maybe that's a little misleading because a lot of this stuff doesn't seem intuitive, but just think about what humans had access to up to even just a few decades ago. Many of us, if we took our great-great-great-grandma and put her in a supermarket that we have today, she would not recognize half of the foods that are around there. And um, I think it's just valuable to keep, when you're trying to figure out if a claim on a food product is actually valid, you know, if that 100-calorie snack pack is going to do your body any favors, ask yourself, is this real food? Is this actual food that I'm consuming, or is it a product that was pieced together by um, food chemists and uh, people who just want to hook me onto their brand so that they have my money? Um, so I think that's always a helpful thought to keep keep in mind. And um, other than that, I just uh, you know respect yourself and don't don't stress out too much about your food choices. If you're trying to adhere to a diet and you backslip, often the stress and guilt of beating yourself up will be less healthy than the actual backslip itself. So just always be kind to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's good advice in any case. Um, and. What do you eat in your diet nowadays? So my diet, um, it's kind of a fusion of all the different diets I've ever been on that I have found kind of work for me. And so a large portion of my, my diet is still raw foods, um, especially raw fruits, raw vegetables, fermented products like kimchi, um, sauerkraut. And uh, along with that, I kind of supplement that with these really nutrient-dense animal foods, such as organ meats. I, I love liver. I think it's uh, one of the best foods anyone can eat. I, I buy uh, pastured eggs from a local farm that are just delicious with very rich gold yolks. Um, I try to make bone broths with, uh, you know, just slow-cooking bones until all the goodness seeps out of them into the broth, and sometimes I make soup with that. Um, sometimes I eat, uh, like, sweet potatoes, tubers. I tend to not eat much um, in the way of grains or grain products, um, but I don't think those are necessarily universally harmful. And I have to say my favorite food ever is salmon sashimi. <laughs> I could just eat raw salmon forever and never grow sick of it. So I, uh, I also often eat sushi as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, apart from that, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I, I do stick with organ meats quite a bit. So you do avoid sugars? Yeah, except for fruit sugar, um, I don't consume any added sugars in my diet. Right. And what about fats? Um, for fats, I eat avocados, um, sometimes coconut products. Um, I don't use a lot of added oils to my food. I find that um, like eating a lot of fatty fish and eggs is uh, my primary source of fat. And how is your health today? It's much better than it was. Um, I'm actually, it's kind of funny, when I was writing my book, I was, I probably entered the worst health that I've had as a, uh, an adult, or in my 20s, largely because it was a result of not sleeping almost ever. I was just working all night on the book, and it was, felt very ironic to um, have my own health suffer while I was writing a book on health, um, but after the book was finished, I've been able to take a little bit better care of myself. But the diet component, I feel like I really found a groove um, for what works for me. I've been eating this way for about, gosh, seven or eight years, maybe nine years, um, just with my particular like raw food, Weston A. Price, Paleo Fusion, and uh, it, it really feels beautiful for my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in addition to diet, there's taking care of yourself, fresh air, sunshine, really all the things that we know intuitively or our mothers told us intuitive that are good for us. Right. So listen up, people. Yeah, that's, that's it, too. It's a big component. It's not just about what you eat. It's about the full lifestyle. Absolutely. So tell us about your blog again. Where, what is the uh, URL? So the URL is rawfoodsos.com. 
com. And uh, if you forget that, it's also you can also go to JaniceMinger.com and it will redirect you to my blog. Um, so I'm available there. I also have Twitter. You know, Denise Minger is my handle. Facebook, just Denise Minger. I think there's only one other Denise Minger like in the world, so it should be easy to find me. <laughs> and um, other than that, I welcome you know contact from my blog. There's a way to uh, just shoot me an email from there if anyone has questions or just wants to to talk about health. And do you have another book in the works? Not yet. <laughs> just take a little bit of recuperation time after this last one. It's really an amazing experience writing a book. It was much more difficult than I ever imagined, but also very rewarding. So take a little bit of a breather, and then we'll see what happens. I thought it was very interesting that your book is published by the Primal Blueprint people who um, uh, publish Mark Sisson's books. Right, yeah. So Mark actually started his own publishing company, and I was one of the first authors he took on board. I have to say that I totally love his cookbook. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Prim Primal Blueprint, and um, it has just the most easy and delicious primal recipes. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, there's some good stuff there. <laughs> Great. Well, Denise, I have been uh, just uh, so enjoying our chat today. We've been speaking with Denise Minger, the author of Death by Food Pyramid, How Shoddy Science, Sketchy Politics, and Shady Special Interests Ruined Your Health, and How to Reclaim It. A very, um, you know, clear-cut, um, no-holes-barred, just write to the information resource.